Hello once again from the Prim Reaper. Well, it's happened. I have published a peer-reviewed paper. Eee! I'm so excited. This was something that I hoped to be able to accomplish from the first time I went into my undergrad. Don't get me wrong, I went into the field of counseling because I ultimately wanted to actively work with and help people, not because I wanted to become a researcher. But I knew I wanted to have at least one piece that I wrote and put through the peer review process just to say that I did it. But holy crap, what a process. And I'm not just meaning the technicalities of writing it or submitting it or managing finicky systems in the publishing process, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Either way, I thought it would make for an entertaining story because the contents of the paper quite naturally relate to the subjects I normally talk about on here. So first, what is the paper about? It is titled, Suggestions to Improve Outcomes for Male Victims of Domestic Abuse, a Review of the Literature. And its purpose is twofold. The first half is a literature review that explores the many different reasons why male victims of domestic abuse may be less likely than female victims to seek support for their situations. The second half is a collection of suggestions that I have put together based on the literature review to make changes to improve the situation, that is, to make services more accessible and accepting of male victims of domestic abuse, to address special problems that they may be likely to face when reaching out, and to change overall public attitudes towards this group of individuals. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to go into the very specific details of the paper, because that would make this video way too long and probably a little on the dry side. However, for context's sake, I will briefly go over each of the subsections, just so you have an understanding of what I'll be talking about throughout the rest of the video. However, if you want to listen to the paper in totality, I will be uploading an audio version in close proximity to this one. Also, I'll be linking the paper in the low bar as well, but I'll talk more about that closer to the end of the video. So for the first section, Barriers to Help Seeking, I covered seven different categories. First is the refusal or reluctance to view their experiences as abuse, then hesitancy or unwillingness to identify with victimizing language, isolation and lack of supportive services, embarrassment, shame, and loss of masculinity, fear of being judged, stereotyped, or disbelieved by others, fear of police response, and lastly, dedication to spouse or family. I spent a long time coming up with these categories and tried to be as comprehensive as possible, pouring through multiple peer-reviewed primary research papers. I also reached out to other researchers directly, as well as the National Program Manager of the Domestic Abuse Recovery Program through CAFE, to ask about his perspectives on common themes in his services for men. Let's just say I put a lot of effort into this paper, and it was the culmination of multiple years of research. As I did multiple projects throughout my master's degree on this subject, and had built up a stockpile of research over a long period of time. The second section of the paper essentially consisted of my overall takeaways from doing all of this research, and listed four main categories of suggestions for change to improve the situation for male victims of domestic abuse. These categories include increasing public awareness, which referred to things such as addressing the popular narrative that domestic abuse is a gendered crime, when in reality much of the research shows a significant amount of gender parity, and drawing attention to the different ways male and female victims may present themselves following their experiences. Next is addressing the unique needs of male victims of domestic abuse, which includes understanding which services men may be more likely to access than women, and ensuring that services are appropriately tailored to men's needs and sensibilities. Then is improving training for service providers, which includes addressing underlying assumptions that men are inevitably the perpetrator in a domestic abuse scenario, and removing outdated and sexist models of domestic abuse that fuel such assumptions like the Duluth model. Lastly is increasing funding for services targeted to male victims of domestic abuse, which is pretty self-explanatory. So now that we have the paper details behind us, let's get into the actual story of how it came to be.
As I briefly mentioned, I gathered the research through multiple projects during my master's degree. First was a small literature review that explored the topic in much lesser detail than the final paper. Then, in a family therapy course, I wrote a paper on high-conflict divorce and parental alienation. It had to be a family-related topic, and I thought it would be good background knowledge to have both for my larger paper and in general. I was originally planning to go into my master's degree pursuing a thesis, but due to family pressures, I opted for the terminal course, which nevertheless included writing this major paper. Obviously, by this point with my initial projects, I had most of the research already completed, but my other papers were a little more theoretical in nature, and I wanted to write something concrete that could be of use to people if it were published. So I set to writing it, and eventually submitted it to my professor for the final grading. Now, let me tell you, in this paper and its progenitor, I was not shy about criticizing feminism and how feminist influences have undoubtedly made it more difficult for male victims of domestic abuse to be recognized and to be able to access supports. In my initial draft, I was quite blunt about this fact and in some of my phrasing on the subject. I had a friend who is experienced with publishing papers look over it, as well as my professor, and she told me that I should be careful with how I phrase some of this stuff, because the paper would be flat out rejected if it was perceived as being anti-feminist. On a similar note, my professor stated essentially that she believed I was at risk of throwing out the baby with the bathwater in criticizing feminism, as many feminists do seek to address the subject of male victims and how they can be helped. You know, the kind of niceties you often hear from the reasonable and or moderate feminists, but that curiously never seem to be reflected in any real-world policies or programs. Unless you're talking about a cursory mention that men can maybe sometimes be victims too on an agency webpage that still features the Duluth model on a page not two clicks away. But, other than these comments, my professor said that it looked like it might be ready to attempt to publish, so with that I cleaned it up a little, selected a journal, and sent it off. My first choice was the Journal of Family Violence, for what probably seems like obvious reasons, but also because there are a lot of journals that just don't really like to accept literature reviews as opposed to formal studies, so I thought that it seemed like a good fit. Alas, I was met with a desk rejection. Their general phrasing was, this piece isn't a good fit with the direction we're trying to take the journal, which just made me roll my eyes because I mean, silly me for thinking that an article discussing the needs of a subset of victims of family violence might be a good fit in a journal called Journal of Family Violence. I would be very surprised if the real problem wasn't that I just wasn't willing to hold back on certain ideological standpoints. Either way, they provided me with a list of other possible journals where I could try to send my paper, and one of them, SN Social Sciences, seemed to be a fine fit. It was a newer journal, with a little more openness to topics in general, so I thought I would give it a go. Sure enough, they sent the paper off for peer review. It took a few months, but I got it back with two responses from the reviewers that, in hindsight, were hilariously different from each other from the get-go. Now, out of respect for privacy and confidentiality of the reviewers, I can't repeat what they said word for word, but I can tell you the general themes. Now, many of you may not be aware, but there's apparently a running joke that reviewer 2 is usually a problem in some way either by not being constructive, being unnecessarily rude, or whatever. But in my instance, reviewer number two was an angel. They were pleasant and explained all the ways in which the paper contributed to the literature and to the understanding of the subject in general, which has up until now been much less studied as compared with female victims. They also pointed out some sections that I could add to enrich the information that the paper was providing, which was nothing but helpful and constructive, and I absolutely agree, did enhance the paper when I added them. Now, on the other hand, for me, it was reviewer one who presented the real challenge. I loathe to go so far as to call them a jerk, because in many ways they did offer some strong suggestions for improvement, 
but at the same time, they often did so in a totally needlessly looking down my nose at you way, that it really did kind of come across like being a jerk. They seemed to contradict a lot of the positive comments that Reviewer 2 provided, which was very confusing. I also got the sense at times that they missed the point in multiple sections, as they offered critiques that didn't fully seem to make sense. For example, there is one section near the end of the paper where I do specifically talk about the unique experiences of gay, bisexual, and transgender men facing abuse in their relationships. Because while these groups do experience many of the same concerns as outlined in the rest of the paper, there are absolutely some special problems that they deal with, and I wanted to be inclusive in adding a section talking about that. Reviewer number one instead chose to view this as me treating the subject like an afterthought. My initial draft of the paper had some specific cultural examples of how expectations for masculinity can impact men's experience of domestic abuse and their willingness to seek help. These examples were based primarily out of Africa, as I had two peer-reviewed studies that covered exactly this topic from a local perspective in both Nigeria and South Africa. However, Reviewer 1 criticized this, stating that my statements were not based on cross-cultural research and fed into stereotypes. Despite referencing peer-reviewed studies from researchers based out of both of these countries, the last critique I'll comment on from Reviewer 1 was very simply that they stated that my critique of feminist models was weak. They didn't tell me how it was weak, just that it supposedly was. I had a bit of a laugh at this point because I knew full well which direction they wanted me to go, but I decided to be a little bit sassy and instead double down, adding to the sections on why I thought focusing on the subject of domestic abuse exclusively from a feminist lens increased the risk of missing alternative perspectives and explanations. The rest of the critique, while curt, offered some useful areas of change for the paper, and although I found it highly stressful at the time, I set out to make changes to the paper based on absolutely every single one of the comments provided by both reviewers. Due to work, volunteer, and family pressures, this process unfortunately took me a couple of months to complete, but nevertheless, I did it and resubmitted it for another round of review. Now, it was this second round of responses that really got my dander up. Not from Reviewer 2, of course. They simply politely stated that they were pleased to see all the changes and the careful thought I gave to responding to every single one of the criticisms. Reviewer 1, however, continued their previous pattern of proceeding to disagree in an opposite sense to nearly every point made by Reviewer 2. Worse than that, though, they frequently made dismissive statements regarding my paper without any comments to back them up. My initial comments were not adequately addressed. I'm not going to tell you which ones, but they just weren't. This review doesn't contribute anything new to the literature, but I'm not going to provide you with any papers that have done the same thing as you have. This review repeats what is known or concludes beyond the evidence. But am I going to provide any citations for this? And of course, despite my efforts to bolster my arguments against an exclusive feminist lens, or to modify the way I presented the evidence from the African researchers, Reviewer 1 was still not satisfied, and they threw in a comment about how I was dismissive of female survivors to boot. I tell you, after years of talking about this subject in various contexts, I cannot tell you how tired I am of people trying to turn this into some kind of weird contest. As if the mere mention that men have the audacity to have problems at the same time that women have problems, you are somehow dismissing women's suffering. The spotlight must always be on me or my cause or it means you don't care about me! It's really quite childish and selfish if you think about it. It would be one thing if I was saying explicitly in the paper that female victims don't matter at all, but I very obviously wasn't. I get it all the time, though, so I feel like I'm a bit of an old hand at responding to such claims reasonably professionally by now. 
I responded as follows. With all due respect, I don't believe that the feminist lens is the only acceptable lens through which to view the subject of domestic abuse. As I outlined in my paper, I actually believe that using this lens exclusively can lead to a narrower perspective of domestic abuse, which is why I criticize these approaches. Furthermore, I don't believe that by merely focusing on male victims as my primary subject, that I am in any way dismissing the significance of what female victims have experienced, any more than papers that primarily discuss female victims of domestic abuse are dismissing male victims. I am simply highlighting that the current focus, up until now, has indeed primarily been on female victims, and that there is an inequity to be addressed as a result. I am not implying that female victims deserve any less attention, but that male victims simply deserve attention that is at least, if not equal, then proportionate to their share of the abuse. And in order to further mitigate any concerns, I added statements to the paper literally stating that my discussing male victims is not meant to minimize the experiences of female victims. I loathe to have to do that, as it feels akin to saying that my enjoying sushi does not mean that I'm trying to minimize the deliciousness of pizza. It should be obvious, but alas, to many it is not. I'll be honest, at this point with how few changes I was able to make based on Reviewer 1's comments this time around, I was just braced for rejection. I feared that this was a scenario in which I wasn't towing the feminist line, wasn't talking about the right subjects, I was just going to be stonewalled forever because I would not be able to make enough changes to satisfy this individual that did not involve compromising my original message. However, to my delight, a few weeks later I received those wonderful words that my paper had been accepted. I nearly fell over in shock. Amusingly, in the acceptance letter with the comments from the editor and the reviewers, reviewer one was conspicuously absent. I'm not 100% certain why that is and can only speculate, but the comments from Reviewer 2 agreed that the feminist lens is not the only acceptable lens through which to view the subject, and thanked me for my important and long overdue work. So that was incredibly vindicating to receive. Now, to return to an earlier point, I'm linking the paper in the low bar, and everyone can access it freely because it's not behind a bullshit paywall. The reason for that is because I actually paid a rather significant amount of money out of pocket to make the paper open access because I believe it is an important topic that should be freely accessible to people, and I hope that people cite it, share it around often, and that even willing agencies could use it as a point of reference to improve their services. I felt that it was worth it to be able to have this information out there for people to see. However, I also know that many other people might appreciate this kind of information being made available like this, and might be interested in contributing to such a thing. So in case any of you felt that way, I made a GoFundMe to help offset some of the personal costs. If this is something you would like to support, I would honestly be eternally grateful. I feel like this is such an important topic that really needs more attention, and now I feel like I'm finally contributing in a legitimate way, so that's great. I also want to encourage people. I know the educational system is heavily biased towards certain ideologies, but this experience proves that you can, at least in some ways, challenge it and still win. And I think that it's imperative that more people continue to do so. If more people stop acting like these are taboo ideas, I think more people will stop treating them that way. Or that's what I hope, anyway. Now, before I end this video, some of you may have heard of the channel Men Are Human. They're a smaller channel, but they are putting together a set of leaflets for International Men's Day next month, and asked if I would help to promote that. Like I just said, I'm happy to help promote ideas that should honestly really be seen as just as basic as anything related to women, so I'll just be posting a link to their campaign in the low bar as well if you'd like to give that a peek. And with all this being said, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I hope to see you all in the next one.